Hi everyone, I think we shall start and uh, I will allow any participant to come slowly, slowly. Okay, so let me start my screen. Okay, so this is the second practice session for BCC. Okay, until it become a clinical consultation uh, station in starting in diet 3, we will continue the old format for now. So just a briefing before we, we proceed. This is just a simple guideline. So today we have two candidates. Uh, which practice a full two stage uh two scenario for full one BCC station. So one candidate you have five minutes uh to prepare outside the scenario. So and then uh, 10 minutes each for each scenario and then followed by the next candidate. So before the second candidate I will discuss on the first candidate regarding the performance and also the things to so that we can learn together. Okay, so I think that's all. So this is the marking scheme. So most likely, actually, if you all uh, manage to practice among yourself in the respective hospital, uh, like a study group, it's also good to actually print out this uh, mark sheet as well as the uh, calibration uh, paper. Because actually, you, if you prepare one scenario for each other, then you realize that actually you know how the examiner can mark and what actually you need to do to, in order to score each component. But generally, we won't be going through the mark sheet today. We just straight go to the scenario. So, uh, Jeremiah, are you ready? To be just testing, eh? can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. I'm ready. Okay, so you're ready. So, uh, we will start uh, to, make the, to make it more like exam situation. I will give you four minutes instead of five minutes. Is it okay? Oh, okay. To come for nervousness, eh? is it? Yeah, so that in exam, actually in exam, we only use two minutes to prepare a scenario. The remaining one minute, basically you are like rushing, sitting, and then after that you are rushing into the room, you pass the mark sheet. So generally, you use four minutes. Huh? So we will give you four minutes, okay? Can, can. Okay. So your four minutes start now. So other friends in this group, uh, you all can actually also try to prepare this scenario. I mean, it's good to like experience the what Jeremiah will be experiencing now. It's just like an exam practice. Try to formulate some differential diagnosis and then uh, need to exclude uh, those warning signs, things to be asked. And try to figure out what to examine in, the, in this station.
Okay, time's up. Okay, Dr. Jeremiah, please enter the room. So this is Miss Vanessa, you may begin. Okay, hello, Miss Vanessa, I'm Jeremiah, I want the doctors here in the clinic. Can I just confirm that you are 35 years of age? Yes, yeah, I'm 35. Okay, uh, Miss Vanessa, I just got a letter here from your GP telling me that uh, you have some problems with your hair. You might be able to tell me a bit more about this. Yeah, so doctor, as you can see, I have long hair and I, I'm actually quite happy with myself. But recently, for the past three weeks, I've been having hair loss. And I'm very worried about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can you specifically tell me which part of the head is affected by this hair loss? I think I noticed uh, it generally it, it actually affects all, all over my uh, scalp. And when I, when I should go for shower, initially I don't notice so much of the hair loss uh, when it's down in, into the water. And as, for the past few weeks, it has been getting worse. It generally occurs mm -hmm. everywhere in my head. I see, I see. Uh, and do you have have you noticed anything that triggered it? Uh, for example, any exposure to any new chemicals or exposure to sunlight in particular? I I I'm using the same shampoo, doctor. I don't really expose to sunlight or anything. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Right. And is this the first time you're having this, or has this happened in the past before? Yeah, this is the first time. Hmm. I see. I see. Okay. All right. Uh, Miss Vanessa, I'm just wanting to ask. Uh, do you have any medical health conditions that I should be aware of? Yeah, so, so doctor told me that I have uh, some liver problem in which uh, my liver failed and I have, to, I have to go for transplant two months ago. I see. Uh, so you, you underwent a transplant uh, two months back. Uh, and any uh, idea particularly what contributed to the liver problem? Yeah, doctor, uh, doctor uh, the, the, the transplant doctor tell me something related to my skin problem. As you can see, my hand uh also got white whitening and they told me it's something related to my antibody in the body i see i see and uh are, are you currently still on any regular follow-up for this uh, transplant issue uh, the liver transplant? yeah one month ago i was follow up yeah mm, okay and uh you are taking your medicines regularly you have not missed out on your medications uh yeah i have taken a lot of medication you see so mm -hmm. i did miss out one of the medication i think the name is called fuconazole like, not very compliant sometimes i i, I didn't take it mm, i see i see and do you have a list of your other medications yeah so i was i'm on uh microphenolate mafotel one gram bd tacolimus 75 mg od uh bactrim uh two tablets od and also the fuconazole i see i see and uh, any particular reason why you're not taking the fuconazole is anessa uh, sometimes I just forget like, because I seldom bring that medication when I work. I see, I see. Okay, we are trying to our best to help you out with this. Uh, okay, and when will be your next follow up under the transplant team? It should be two weeks later. I see, okay, okay. And apart from this problem with the liver acquiring a transplant, do you have any other health issues that I should be aware of? Uh, not that I know of, la, but I do feel very stressed la, because of work. I'm a beautician, you see, so and this thing has been affecting me a lot. Mm, I see, I see. I'm sure that's causing you a lot of trouble. Uh, so, Miss Vanessa, apart from this problem with the hair loss, do you have any other problems uh, that I should uh, that's concerning you? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so far, I don't feel any symptom other than just hair loss. Mm, I see, I see. I'm just going to run through a number of different questions and see if it actually uh, applies to you. Uh, do you have any shakiness of your hands? No, no shakiness. Okay, and have you noticed any abnormal uh, growth of hair anywhere else on the part of the body? For example, over on the upper lip or over on the chin? Uh, no. Okay, uh, do you have any vomiting or feeling ill or throw, uh, wanting to throw up? No. Any tummy ache? Uh, no, no tummy ache. Any problem? Any particular weather preferences? For example, you prefer hot or cold weathers. I have been feeling normal. I don't feel any difference. Hmm. Okay. And uh, do you have a feeling of uh, uh giddiness, particularly when you stand up? No. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and I noticed that you have some uh, whitening of the skin around your hand areas. And can you just tell me a bit more about this? Is this something new, or have you always had this problem? Yeah, I think I always had this problem. I noticed since young when, when, when I was in teenager time. Like, I thought it's because of my skin problem. Mm, okay, okay. And uh, are you applying anything for this or are you seeing any doctors for this? No, not really. Mm, 
Okay, okay. Uh, any problem with uh, fever or high body temperature? No. Any problem with cough or difficulty in breathing? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, any problem with your bowels or your waterworks? No. Okay, right. Uh, and uh, Miss Vanessa, um, okay. Uh, do you take any other medicines apart from that, that which is given to you by the doctor, transplant doctors? No. Okay. Uh, specifically, do you take anything over the counter or any herbal remedies? No, no. Okay. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that uh, you work as a beautician. Yes. I I'm sure this is uh, uh, affecting your, your work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I feel very stressed, actually. Mm, I see, I see. Okay. Do you mind if I just ask you a number of different questions? Uh, it, it's rather sensitive, but we generally just ask it uh, to all our patients, if that's okay with you. Okay, doctor. Okay. Um, do, do, you, do you happen to smoke? No, I'm not smoking. Do you take much alcohol? No, I don't drink. Two okay. minutes left. Anything? Okay. Do you take any... Okay. Do you mind if I just examine you? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'd like to get a blood pressure reading for this patient. Uh, is that told you the blood pressure is normal? Okay, and then I'd like to have a look at the scalp, looking for any scarring alopecia or any alopecia areata. Uh, it's generally there is scars, uh, sparse hair, and there is no scarring seen. Okay, uh, and uh, looking at the gum for any gingival hyperplasia. No gingival hyperplasia. And then uh, the abdominal wound appears to be well healed. Any abdominal tenderness? No abdominal tenderness. I see. Okay. Uh, Miss Vanessa, does what, uh, is anything that concerns you? Yeah, so doctor, uh, can my hair regrow back? Uh? Yeah, Miss Vanessa, I suspect that this is possibly something related to your medications that you're taking after the transplant. Particularly, um, this medication called Tacrolimus and this can sometimes cause your hair loss. Uh, but it's important for you to continue taking it uh, to ensure that the transplant continues to work. Uh, so we will actually get some blood tests done. And I'll probably refer you back to the, the transplant doctors for further management. Doctor, can this be due to the my liver problem in the past? Uh? Uh, it's a little bit less likely um, as uh, there's no... Uh, but, but we have to confirm this by running certain tests to uh, find out further. Okay. Can, and, and what can I do if this is permanent then? If this, if this hair loss is permanent, what can I do about it? Uh, so actually, there are different ways that we can tackle it. Number one, I think we will get you a review under our skin doctors and they can recommend uh, for some uh, treatments or some oral tablets that you can try. Uh, or uh, if alternatively, if uh, that doesn't work, uh, I mean for cosmetic purposes, we can try on some uh, other things like a hair transplant or maybe perhaps putting on an artificial wig uh, to, to help with the, 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 the cosmetic issue. Okay, thank you, doctor. Okay, time's up. As a minor question, uh, Dr. Jeremy, can you tell, can you run, run me through the different the diagnosis and differential analysis for this patient? Okay, uh, so I, I suspect this uh, tacrolimus induced alopecia. Uh, that would be my professional diagnosis. My differential diagnosis, I tried to rule out alopecia areata. Particularly, this patient has uh, evidence of uh, vitiligo and uh, possibly underwent a transplant, uh, secondary to uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Okay. Um, Any other differential? So, uh, uh, the other thing I looked out for is probably possibly hypo or hyperthyroidism and then uh, she does not have any scarring alopecia which might suggest things like uh, FLD or hyperlipid. Okay, how about, uh, what do you comment about the fluconazole? Um, the patient has not been regularly taking it with, uh, which is uh, something that we need to address during the transplant meet. Okay, how will you investigate the patient? You have mentioned the, t the drug level monitoring. Other than that, is there anything else you want to do? Uh, I would like to do a, a thyroid function test, doing a full blood count, looking for evidence of other uh, pernicious anemia, which might happen in this lady because she has autoimmune disorders. Uh, doing a renal function and a liver function test to see how the graph is functioning. Um, and I would uh, then also refer this patient back to the transplant team and maybe possibly the dermatology for, dermatologist for further review. Okay, how do you manage? Uh, for starters, I think um, the, the, I'll, I'll have to be, have a discussion with the transplant team regarding the tacrolimus therapy. If uh, this is some, some, whether it's possible to change it to some other form of immunosuppressant, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, 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 for cosmetics, 
uh, the patient might try things like uh, minoxidil uh, if it helps and if really necessary uh, hair transplant or a weak artificial hair. Okay, great. You may proceed with next station. So this is the next station. Please uh, proceed. Okay, uh, we Mr. John and Jeremiah, one of the doctors here in the, clean, uh, in the unit. Uh, may I just confirm you're Mr. John and you're 56 years of age? Yeah, Mr. John. Okay, Mr. John, I got a letter here from your doctor telling me that you have some problem with your, your, your vision. You might just tell me a bit more about this. Yeah, so doctor, I have been having this uh, burning of vision uh, for the past uh, three months and it has been progressively getting worse. And I noticed I, my vision is actually quite clear if I close my close my right eye. But when I open my right eye, my my vision become blurred. I see, I see. And uh, how has it changed in these past three months? Uh, it had been almost static, I would say, because it started gradually. I didn't realize that. I thought it's because of my glass that I was, I was wearing since many years ago. So it, I thought it's maybe because my lens got some problem. After I changed the glass, it's the same. It's still the same. I see. And the, uh, is the eye painful at any time or does it appear red? Uh, no pain, no redness as well. Mm, I see, I see. Okay, okay. And uh, apart from this problem with the vision, have you had any other problems of you no? Know, particularly, have any headaches? Uh, I, I, I don't have. I don't have any headache. I see. Uh, have you noticed that the vision is particularly worse at certain times of the day? For example, towards the end of the day, or when you stare long at certain objects? No, it has been there. I mean, it, it didn't get worse or not during the course of the day. Uh, do you experience any uh, weakness over on any parts of the body? No weakness. No weakness, yeah? Okay. Mr. John, do you happen to have any other health uh, issues that I should be aware of? Yeah, doctor, uh, my, my GP told me that I have gastritis before. They told me I have some reflux, uh, GERD is it called, and also got diabetes mellitus. Mm, okay. And are you on regular follow-up for this? Yeah, yeah. I'm regular follow-up on metformin, 1 gram BD, and pentoprazole 40 OD for that. Mm, I see, I see. Okay, and uh, you mentioned that you are, you are, you have diabetes. Uh, do you happen to know what your sugar readings are usually like? My doctor told me my sugar reading was quite good for the three months control. is about six point two. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, and do you apart from the medicines that you're taking from the GP, do you happen to take anything over the counter? Uh, no, no. Any traditional herbs or medicines? No. Okay, all right. Uh, okay. Mr. John, uh, I'm going to be asking you a couple of questions uh, and see whether it pertains to your condition. Have you ever had any history of uh, falls or hitting your head? No. Do you have any fever? No fever. Do you have any uh, problems with, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, difficulty in looking into bright lights? Uh, no, I think it's the same. Okay, alright. Uh, and this has never happened before this, uh, this problem with your eyes? No, I think it only happened in the recent three months. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, do you have any other, uh, apart from the problem in the eyes, do you have any problem with, your, for example, your waterworks or your bowels? Uh, my bowel motion has been quite good. My waterworks, I, I don't have any issue with passing urine. Okay. Any problem with the lungs or uh, any chest tightness? Lungs, you mean? Uh, sorry, uh, do you have any problem with your breathing? Breathing? I, I don't have problem with my breathing. No, I don't, ha don't have any chest, chest discomfort. Okay, sure. Thanks. Uh, do you happen to smoke, Mr. John? Yeah, so honestly, I, I really smoke a lot. I smoke about two packs every day for the past 30 years. Mm, I see, I see. Okay. Mr. John, I just have to advise you uh, that smoking is uh, not good for your health uh, in many different ways. So if it's possible and you're keen for it, we'll refer you to the smoking stop smoking clinic at the end of this consult. Is that okay, please? Okay, doctor. Okay, sure. Uh, so I'd like to proceed to examine Mr. John. I noticed that he has a dilated left-sided pupil. Uh, so uh, I'd like to examine the visual acuity for the left, uh, both eyes. Both eyes, the visual acuity is actually normal. Uh, left is actually 6 out of 6. Right is actually 6 out of uh, 12. 6 out of 12 on the right-hand side. Huh? Mm. Okay, and then I'd like to perform a visual field testing for both eyes. So visual field testing, uh, both are intact. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no visual field loss. Okay. Any ophthalmoplegia uh, on uh, ocular, uh, extraocular muscle testing? So on the H test, the movement for all seems normal, intact. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'd like to perform a fundoscopy for this patient. 
As I mentioned, told you you can skip because it's time consuming. But generally, the finding is normal. I like to perform fun. Uh, sorry, testing for fat muscle fatigability by asking the patient to look up for 10 to 20 seconds. As I mentioned, say no need. Mm -hmm. I like to check for uh, tendon reflexes for this patient to look for any absent and RA reflex. Yeah? Uh, reflex is normal, both sides. Mm -hmm. Any thyroid goiter? Uh, there's no neck swelling. Mm -hmm. uh, any other obvious, apart from the eyes, any facial uh, abnormalities for this patient? There's no facial abnormalities. Mm, okay. Uh, I'd like to perform a blood pressure reading and also a glucose stick reading for this patient. So, as you mentioned, you want to do that, as a, uh, the patient show you his hand. The blood pressure is normal. The sugar, as I mentioned, not relevant. Okay. Uh... Okay, uh, so Mr. John, can I just ask, uh, is anything in particular which is concerning you? Yeah, so uh, doctor, I really worried, uh, I don't know what happened to this. And then, do you notice that my, my, my right hand is also like become a bit thin? So I'm also worried. I'm worried, is this due to something dangerous? Hmm, okay. So I think, uh, Mr. John, there can be a number of different uh, reasons uh, why your, your eyes might be blurred in this case. Uh, so I think uh, this is a problem with the nerve of the eye and particularly now that also have uh, evidence of uh, some, some problem with the hands as well. Uh, can I, does, does this problem in the hands cause you any weakness or difficulty in grasping things? No weakness, doctor, but I feel a bit numb, especially with my little fingers. Okay. Uh, any, I'd like to perform a sensory testing for this patient. Any sensory loss for this patient? So you are checking the pain sensation. There is a reduced uh, pain sensation over the C8 and T1 region. Mm -hmm. C8 and T1. Huh? Okay, okay. Uh, okay. So I also like to... Okay. Ah, then I would like to oscillate the lung apex looking for any um, any evidence of a pancos tumor. Yeah, so when you oscillate the lung, it appears that the right upper zone seems to have increased uh, vocal resonance with bronchial breathing. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, Mr. John, I suspect that this uh, problem is uh, due to something originating from the lungs. And it, sometimes it, it presses onto the nerves, uh, controlling the, the, the hands. And also, these nerves uh, go towards the, 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 the brain as well, the, the, the eyes. And uh, that has sometimes might cause problems with your vision. So I think we do need to run some further tests to find out a bit more about this. Okay, is, so, is this curable, doctor? Uh, it depends on the, the cause of uh, this, this problem with the lungs. Mr. John, have you been losing weight? Yeah, doctor, I've been having weight loss for the past six months. Mm, I see. And uh, how much of weight have you been losing? I lost a total of six kg. Okay, time's up. Okay, so uh, Dr. Jeremiah, can you tell me the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis for this patient? So uh, I suspect that this patient has a right-sided uh, Horner's syndrome, possibly secondary to a right-sided Pankos tumor. Uh, taken that the patient has a strong smoking history of 60 pack years, has been having loss of weight. Um, yeah. Okay, do you ask about any cough symptom? Uh, I, no, I didn't ask about cough. I asked about problems with breathing. Have you asked about any surgery done before? No, I didn't ask about surgery. Okay, all right. So how will you investigate this patient? So I'd like to uh, perform some uh, chest x-ray uh, to confirm my finding and possibly arrange a contrasted CT scan eventually. Um, and i also like to do some blood tests, uh, looking for a full blood count, looking for anemia, looking at renal function, which uh, might show evidence of hyponatremia. Uh, looking for the calcium or evidence of hypercalcemia, uh, liver function tests which might be deranged in cases of metastasis. Okay, all right. How will you manage this patient? So I also like to refer this patient uh, urgently to the respiratory physicians for further workup, possibly a bronchoscopy and also a biopsy of the lung lesion. Okay. Uh, I also like to refer this patient over to the ophthalmologist for further management of his eye issues. Any other things that you want to offer? Uh, which refer to a nutritionist and a dietitian for nutritional supplementation. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you have advice about smoking, right? Stop smoking. Any other thing you want to offer? Yeah. Uh, so a referral to a smoking cessation clinic. Okay. How about vaccination? Yeah. How about vaccination? Uh, so the patient would need a uh, vaccination for pneumococcal and influenza vaccine. So influenza every year and a pneumococcal. Okay, thanks up. Thanks up. Okay, all right. Okay, how do you feel? <laughs> yeah, I got... Uh, I, I, initially, I thought it was a left-sided spasma for me, but then uh, but, I think the, the, the resonance chart showed the left is normal and she has not got the problem in the right eye. But I thought the history I told you is the right eye that is actually blurred. When I close my right eye, the vision seems normal. Oh. Yeah, I think you missed that part. I totally missed yeah. that part. Yeah, I can see that you, you, you are struggling with the diagnosis. But it's okay. Uh, I think we will go through... Wait, uh, let me see if we are going through that. Okay, uh, probably we'll go through your discussion first. But before I, before I mention about the cases, how do you feel for the first case? The case of alopecia? Uh, it was quite tough, I suppose, because uh, everything I asked also came out as negative. <laughs> and I think I spent too much time on the, the history before going to examination. Yeah, so you only spent 30 seconds for examination. Uh, that's a bit dangerous because a lot of things to examine actually. You need to check the thyroid status as well. So you need, also need to comment there's no mala rash, uh, there's no uh, any atropathy, like for example, jackal atropathy to, to actually exclude SLE. And you need to check the scar over the transplant region to make sure that it's not infected. At the same time, you also need to, I mean, you, you did check her, her hair to comment on it. But you also need to comment on any lesion, any fungal lesion that can actually be appreciated. So, so let's say, uh, what is your differential diagnosis other than you have mentioned tacolimus induced alopecia, you have mentioned alopecia areata, you have mentioned autoimmune thyroid disease. Any other differential diagnosis you want to offer? Uh, I said SLE and this quite lupus as well. Okay, this kind of lupus is good, but I mean, you didn't ask about the rash over the face, right? Mm. Yeah, but I mean, she showed you her pretty face, there's no, no rash, la, so it's okay. So, any other differential? La? She told you she's very stressful, right? Uh, yeah. How about it? Any differential that I don't see you can offer? I trichotillomania, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that one is a bit, uh, a bit, a bit over. La. So, but telogen, telogen effluvium is related to stress. Huh? Telogen effluvium is related to stress. And the, and the fungal lesion, I mean, the misfuconazole in the immunocompromised patient, you also need to make sure you're not dealing with tinea capitis as well. Okay, so we will go through. Okay, so we will go through the first BCC. La. So, Jenny, I think you did quite well because you managed to get a diagnosis and the investigation, all that is. It's okay, la. I think it can, can accept. Okay, but, but probably I think your history spent too much time, really too much time. The alopecia part, you ask, and then you ask early about medical history, which is good, and the surg surgical history, I uh, volunteered because of the medical condition, and drug history, you ask early, and you also ask early on the social history. But in terms of the SLE, and I mean, I, I can see that you try to exclude direct symptom, but the SLE part, uh, you didn't exclude much of the SLE symptom uh, other than asking about any uh, worsening of symptom under the under the hot sun. And but generally I think you got most of the history. Uh, but in the sign, I think you really need to make sure that there is no uh, there's no fine tremor to suggest no tacolimus toxicity on top of commenting on the thyroid status. And you have commented on the incision, the scar, but you didn't comment on the SLE part, uh, which I think is also quite important negative finding. So the diagnosis, yes, diagnosis for for this patient is a tacolimus induced uh, alopecia post transplant, and the differential is alopecia areata because of autoimmune association. Same goes to autoimmune association with SLE. That's why cutaneous lupus is another possibility, and because of autoimmune association as well, autoimmune thyroid disease, be it Hashimoto or Graves disease, is also another possibility. So stress because patient have stress, so you should also include telogen effluent as part of the differential diagnosis. And lastly, I actually, I actually, this is not an easy scenario, but it came out in Tengano Center in diet in I think last diet, yeah, diet one. 
But I think the scenario wasn't that difficult. But the differential diagnosis they expected indeed include other pressure areata, cutaneous lupus, autoimmune thyroid, and tacrolimus. They did not comment on the stress and also the fungus, uh, the tinea capitis, uh, which, but I think it's quite important for us to actually exclude that as well. Investigation, other than taking a TDM, you must also make sure that you have to exclude the differential analysis. That's why I think thyroid function you should mention. Uh, you didn't mention about thyroid function. And also, because you want to rule out uh, other autoimmune associated disease, you can actually order the autoimmune panel to actually kind of like rule SLE as well. And if you're not sure, then also you should mention that you want to perform a uh, referral to the skin doctor to do a dermoscopy. In which, if this is a low pressure areata, you are expected to find exclamation point, uh, point, exclamation pointed end hairs. Okay, and if you're suspecting fungal infection, you want to exclude because she's immunocompromised. You should also mention that probably I can do a skin scraping for fungal, uh, to see whether there's any infection. Nah. management, you have to mention education and counseling as well. And I think your con, the, the managing concern part, you maybe may not able to get the marks if you con, if you say that. To continue the tacrolimus because i think uh alopecia is one of the side effect that warrants a uh, changing of immunosuppression so you should straight away tell the patient that i think this is a serious issue but i need to talk to the transplant doctor and most likely we may need to switch you on other immunosuppression because you have suffered quite a big uh quite a significant side effect okay and you mentioned about topical minoxidil, which is good. And don't forget that actually topical steroid also sometimes works. And you also suggest Havix, which is, which is good as well. You address the concern, that part quite well. And emotional support, you didn't mention about the stress. Lah. So you didn't address the stress. He told you it's stressful, you're working as a beautician, but you forgot to kind of address the, the stress. Lah. You should tell her that, I can see that you are very stressful. Probably if you, if you need any assistance, I can actually link you to uh, any mental health doctor if you need any support. And concern-wise, can my hair we go back? Actually, you have to really answer the question. You didn't answer the question well. You say that uh, it depends. But actually, tacrolimus induced alopecia uh, may or may not be reversible. So you have to tell her straight that the, the, the hair that was lost may not able to go back. At the same time, if we stop the drug early, we switch it, there may, may be a chance that the hair can actually be we grow as well so it's still difficult to decide can, what can i do is permanent yes the the answer was actually the hair wigs uh. i think the that that real exam scenario was also expecting hair wigs as well and can this be due to my liver problem in the past yeah so autoimmune basically the patient is trying to ask you about the autoimmune uh, liver disease can this actually cause alopecia uh? you should answer the patient that uh not not directly but however you have this uh uh higher risk to develop other form of disease in which the antibody may attack on different organs. So that can, may also explain why you may have this condition. But Jenny, for this station, I think you, I think you, do, you did well. So this is just uh, my, my personal notes on how to actually uh, classify alopecia when you approach it. So scaring or non-scaring sometimes is difficult from the history. Unless patient can tell you got raw when you scratch 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 until you got got you know skin uh, all the all the old skin come out. But usually you have to decide when you examine the patient, and it's also important to divide the patient whether it's localized or generalized uh, uh, alopecia. So localized is most of the time is is alopecia areata, which is associated with autoimmune disease and autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. Usually they will have family history. So actually for this scenario, it's also quite helpful if you're able to ask any family history of hair loss as well. So it may actually give you a clue of other pressure areata if there is. Tinea capitis, yes, especially patients of fluconazole and immunocompromised. Trico trichotillomania, you did mention that, but she was not that depressed yet. And then pressure, not much. Generalized, basically, uh, endocrinal causes. Lah. I mean, hair loss, most of the top differential you should know is the hypothyroidism, right? But hypothyroidism as well can also cause uh, uh, hair loss. And malnutrition, rarely. And drug commonly is tacrolimus, other than the OCP and also chemotherapy drug. Probably you should, you did mention about any over the counter drug. La. So some people may not consider hormonal pills as OCP. La. If you ask me, I would say she's she's also actually taking OCP as well. And infective parts, syphilis, not really. And then telogen influence is something that I think we should mention as well because she's in stress. So, I mean, we know that stress can actually induce uh, early changes of the hair causing degeneration. That's why telogen effluent is another differential diagnosis. And alopecia areata totalis is another possibility, but generally it's quite severe and not happen in this case. Lah. You also mentioned about scaring uh, alopecia, which is the discoid SLE, and also scleroderma, if there is, the morphia. 
and lichen planus usually very rare. Okay. So second scenario. So second scenario is about a case of right blurring of vision because he told you that the vision has been blurred for three months, but the when he closed his right eye, the vision seems normal. So this itself should give you a clue that this is you are dealing with the right eye pathology. So I think you have to be very careful in this kind of scenario, especially the pupil is unequal, anisocoria. You need to really know, and, and this is a station, unlike a neural examination, you can ask history. So history will give you a clue which eye is abnormal, as opposed to when you examine the patient in a neural station, sometimes it can be difficult and may, may be stressed out. So if you ask, actually it's the right eye that's abnormal. So right eye abnormal and there's a right partial tosis as well. If you can see back the eye, actually there is a right partial tosis. So you can see the eyelid here and here. Probably not very obvious because the pupil is already myos myotic and that therefore you don't you see like almost e same level. But actually because of the myotic pupil, the the eye is actually lower down compared to the to the left eye. So basically, yeah. So if you manage to get that this is a right horner syndrome, you are excluding the cause, you go from central to pre-ganglionic and post-ganglionic. So you should actually ask very focused history. Uh, any history of stroke, yes, you can ask that. Any walking is stability, you did ask that. You want to rule out any lateral mandibular syndrome, and you also want to uh, screen for any shingomaria, for example. That's why you ask about. You should also ask about any difficulty of to passing pass urine or or pass motion, and at the same time, uh, another thing is because you are suspecting at a level of preganglionic, possibly you are dealing with uh, any neck pathology. So that's why you also need to screen uh, for pancreas uh, syndrome. So you should actually ask about. Uh, Voluntarily ask about the lung cancer screening. You should ask about any cough, any coughing of blood, any weight loss, and any you ask about fever, yes, but any loss of appetite. So all this is quite important to screen through the the lung cancer part for pancreas syndrome. Another one is you need to ask any recent manipulation to your neck. Do you went to any you know neck massage and do you went for any surgery over your neck? I think it's also very important to exclude the neck pathology. Next is also ask about any neck swelling, any lumps and bumps over the body, especially over your neck. This can exclude limb node as well as thyroid problem. You can ask more specific questions if less than there is, like thyroid symptom, screen for thyroid status. Next is actually post -ganglionic. So post is more to something related to vessel, like chaotic aneurysm or chaotic chaotical fistula, things like that, which is very rare. But basically, if you ask about any past history, any any putting of the lines or any, for example, any invasive surgery was done, can pretty much rule out that one. Okay, so this patient actually came out as a real case as well in London. I think a few years back before COVID lah. So, uh, that was a case of Horner syndrome with a uh, Pankow syndrome as well. So, and I, I remember my specialist told me the time when he got this station in London, he. Uh, the first four minutes, he really have no idea what he's doing, trying to do. He cannot get a history, you know. He cannot get the diagnosis. Actually, he cannot get the honor because he he, he didn't able to appreciate the, that that patient partial ptosis and the meiosis was not as obvious as this photo, and he cannot really elicit anything. Basically, he's like, okay, that eye problem. He thought it's like you know probably optic retrobarba, optic neuritis, things like that, but no eye pain or anything. So. Then, then he decided to take a step back. He just relaxed and then he just take a step back and he looked at the patient, just look at the patient's face only. Then he realized that actually the right the right eye actually slightly the eyelid slightly lower down. So actually the patient have a right partial eyetosis. So he immediately go and check the pupil. Pupil is indeed really smaller compared to the left side. So he knows that that is the pancos, uh that is the horner syndrome. Immediately he really rushed to check the lung and and the lung really got a mess there. And and he immediately go and check the the hand, which actually shows video sensation as a CA and T1 distribution. So I encountered this scenario in my uh neuro clinic before HKL. One of my specialists also give me this patient as the exam neuro exam station, look and proceed kind of station. So I also I, I feel myself actually I feel that station that time that was really really long be before I really start to prepare for patients. So that time uh, I cannot get the Horner syndrome actually. I was also confused when I check, check, check. It's like, oh, pathology is over the right eye, but but I cannot get the honor. I I also thought pathology is over the left eye. It's a left dilated uh, pupil. That time I thought. Then until the point that examiner asked me, what, you want to see the shirt? Then I take out the shirt of the patient and notice that there is a lateral thoracotomy scar over the right apex. I mean the right upper upper back. 
and that is so obvious that when I check the sensation is also reduced. Uh. So that one since since that time I actually really learn about Horner syndrome because Horner syndrome is a case that is not common. But when it come out, we really need to score it. We really need to score it because it's quite easy. It's just that you need to get familiarized with the scenario. So clinical sign, you should mention that there's a right eye partial ptosis, but no chemosis. You should uh you want to examine the neck, check for any scar, any buoyed as well. You want to escort it for buoyed and any puppet for any limb node or any direct grand swelling. And then lungs, yes, you have examined that, but very last minute. Lah. And then when you want to address concern, you cannot address because you don't know what the diagnosis That's why you decided to go take a step back and examine back the patient. And you must examine upper limb for this kind of patient lah, in which you expect muscle wasting and reduced sensation at the CAT1. So he has a right panko syndrome. And investigation, yes, x-ray, CT, PET, and then calcium, IPTH, RP, and AM cortisol, all those things. And I think generally for this patient with a heavy smoker, you should mention stop smoking, yes. But in all recipe stations, always mention about vaccination. You must really counsel them for vaccination. And you should mention that it's involved multidisciplinary team, not only chest physician, also involving the oncology, clinical oncology, and also rehabilitation team. And the definitive management will depend on the biopsy report of whether this is a small cell or non-small cell. So what do I have? You should mention that you may have a growth in your lung, upper part of your lung, and this that actually compresses on the on the nerve that actually controls your movement of your eye size as well. And this curable at this point of time cannot ascertain and will die. Uh it's still early to tell, but we hope that we can get get back to you and get give you an answer later. So probably that's all. Okay. So Jeremy, you got any question before we proceed with second candidate? Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay. So okay, so oh I forgot that I have like one more slide. Probably I just go through here. So this is just Horner syndrome, just to let everyone kind of like refresh. For those who are not familiar with Horner syndrome, probably this is a good time to do revision together. Lah. So you can see that Horner syndrome got three levels. Lah. So it's central, pre-ganglion and post-ganglion. The ganglion we refer to is actually the SVC, lah, SCG, the superior cervical ganglion. So the first order, which is the central for hypothalamus, go up to the uh, brain stand, passing through the medulla, and then go into the spinal cord. And then ends at the level of T1, which is a sympathetic tongue. Okay, so the second order is actually preganglionic, which is before the superior cervical ganglion, but after T1. So this lesion is very sensitive, especially any lung pathology. You can see here, any lung pathology, any neck manipulation is very sensitive. And after the superior cervical ganglion, it's what we call as postganglionic, which is a third order. So you are living with all the vessels. So it lunges from the internal, uh, actually from the internal carotid artery and then go into the carotid canal and then uh, enters the superior orbital fissure and also uh, uh, this uh, uh, carbonous, uh, sinus syndrome, uh, carbonous sinus as well and then following the optic nerve enters the eye and, and actually innervates the, the tarsal muscle which control the pupillary splinter and also the pupillary dilator. Uh, actually mainly it's the pupillary dilator instead of pupillary splinter. So what, how do we know it? I mean, how do we learn about Horner syndrome? Basically, you classify into three levels. So go by each level. When you want to screen for Horner causes, go by up to down. So for, for first order Horner, the first thing you want to rule out is actually stroke. I mean mid-brain stroke, lah, which is any weakness, you can easily exclude that. But the next thing is the medulla, which is the lateral medullary syndrome. You know lateral medullary syndrome got this 4S, right? So you really need to look out whether there's any lateral medullary syndrome by checking that other than Horner, is there any nystagmus to suggest is lateral uh, spinal cerebellar tract involvement? Is there any is lateral uh, spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve in which your V1 to V3 at that same site will be reduced with contralateral spinal thalamic uh, sensory loss, which is the other side. Like let's say this patient have a right Horner you will expect the right V1 to V3 over the face reduced with also video sensation over the left uh, left uh, pain and also the temperature over the left upper limb and lower limb. But there's no weakness generally. And up to the level of spinal cord, you're dealing with sphingomyria. So you're dealing with sphingomyria, you should ask about any spinal cord symptom or sign, any bladder or bowel incontinence. Okay. So after beyond the spinal cord, uh, this region is particularly more to Panko syndrome and also whether there's any limb node or any cervical rib, any bone, more than mechanical causes that compresses because it's very near the apex of the lung. Then after the superior cervical ganglion is basically you want to look for whether there's any 
dissection, aneurysm, thrombosis, and all the eye, the, the three classical eye syndrome, uh, commonest sinus syndrome, sophie orbital fissure syndrome, and also orbital attack syndrome. Uh. So you're checking for any chemosis. You also want to check for visual acuity. Yes, this scenario visual acuity is very important because you want to make sure the second nerve is intact. And you also want to look, when you examine the neck, you really want to look for any chaotic buoy uh, because this may give a clue that you are dealing with chaotic aneurysm or chaotical covenants. Uh, chaotical covenants is quite high up. Uh, so it's, you are more to any chaotic uh, vein, uh, chaotic artery thrombosis or any aneurysm. Okay, so I hope this clear the mind up. So basically, uh, Horner, so another question you may ask is actually loss of setting. Uh. So loss of setting is only happen in uh, pre ganglionic and central. Uh. So central, it affects more, it innervates the muscle or the face. That's why, and also the, you know, just like medulla, lateral medulla syndrome, right? it also affects the contralateral spinal thalamic tract, which also explains why the reduced sensation over the upper arm, shoulder, and also the, also the forearm and hand as well. So if the first order is affected, you will have loss of setting from the face, from the, I mean, the eyebrow, the face, the neck, the shoulder, up to upper arm. So everything will be lost. I mean the loss of sweating. Second order, generally only the face is lost, and generally because it's already beyond the innervation of the mandala and also the spinal cord, and only the face is lost. As post ganglionic, basically you won't have any loss of sweating. So this is another thing to, to be mentioned if you want to ask maybe about the history. Okay, so I think that's all for now. So Ku, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah, I think your, your audio is a bit soft. Can you uh, probably speak louder? Okay, is that okay now? Yeah, yeah, it's better. Okay, so you are ready, yeah? So I will give you four minutes, uh, instead of five minutes, uh -huh, just for exam practice. So four minutes to prepare both scenarios, and I will start the timer the moment the, the exam stand is shown. You, you have paper and pen with you already, right? Yes, yes. Okay, let's start.
Okay, time's up for four minutes. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, so this is Mr. Alex. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Alex. I'm Dr. Ko, doctor in charge of the clinic today. Um, I understand that you are coming for uh, loose stool for three months. Can you tell me more about your diarrhea? Yeah, so doctor, I've been suffering from this uh, loose stool for the past three months. So it, sometimes it comes and go. It actually never resolves. Sometimes it feels better, sometimes it feels worse. And generally, I pass like really brown color kind of stool and sometimes watery. And I, I don't know what happened to me. Okay, uh, is there any blood in your stool? No, no blood. Okay, so do you have any tummy pain? Yeah, doctor. Every time when I have this uh, episode of uh, diarrhea, I also have tummy pain as well. Alright, can you show me which part is your tummy pain? It's actually at my center, near my, yeah, yeah. Okay. How, how does it feel? I mean, uh, the nature of it, can you describe? It's like colicky like that. It feels crampy kind of sensation. Uh, sensation. Okay, is it the tummy pain will relieve after you pass motion? Uh, actually, it relief if it relief after passing motion. You are right. Okay, all right. Uh, back to the diarrhea. Um, is there anything that it will worse make your diarrhea worse? Yeah. Or I, I, or yeah, I, I I do notice that if I because you know I am actually a heavy drinker la, so I, I like I like beer. So every time when I drink beers a lot, then this diarrhea tends to get worse. All right. Okay. Anything that will make it uh, I mean, better? Not really. It comes and go. Okay. So except the alcohol, uh, any other thing that make it worse? Yeah. So I also like to eat cheese. Sometimes also I take some chocolate la. So I notice that when I when I eat this this kind of food, the the diarrhea seems to be uh, getting worse. Oh. Okay. So only uh, for the past uh, three months. And how's the progression? Is it worsening? Uh, I would say it's almost the same. It comes and goes. It doesn't get worse. All right. How's your appetite? Any change? Uh, not really. My appetite has been quite okay. All right. Any weight change recently? Uh, my weight has been static. All right. Um, any um, uh, weather preference? Uh, no. Okay. Do you feel uh, shakiness of your hands? No. Okay, any uh, feeling uh, a lot of sweating? Uh, I don't really notice any sweating, but I do have a lot of, as you can see my face now, I'm, I'm actually flushing. It's not because I'm shy, but I don't know why sometimes my face become red. And I sometimes also have this racing or heartbeat kind of sensation. Alright, okay. Um, uh, talking about your racing of heartbeat, is, is that, I mean, every day or it's related to your diarrhea? It's related to my diarrhea when this, I mean, all these things come together la, and, we, and, we, and, and they go off at the same time also. Alright, okay. Do you have headache? No, no headache. Any blurring of vision? No. Okay. Uh, do you have any, um, uh, any, any past medical history? Yeah. So, doctor, I, I, my, my, my glands doctor told me that I have this, uh, growth in my pituitary gland la. So, but they told me it's actually doesn't actually secrete any hormone. La. It's a, a non-functioning thingy in which I had done the surgery uh, to the nose uh, three years ago. La. Then after that, I don't have any other problem. So you, uh, the, the, the gland has been removed? Yeah, they told me have removed uh, completely. All right. Okay. So did they supply, supplement you with any hormone? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on hydrocortisone. I'm also on thyroxine as well. And, tyrosine. and so uh, do you compliant to that? Yes, I'm in compliant. So you never miss your medication. Mm. Okay. Alright. Uh, do you have any surgery other than the pituitary gland? No. Uh, any allergy do you have? No, no allergy. Any family members with uh, cancer particularly? Uh, I think my mother actually also got some... Uh, I don't know what she has, la, but she, she, she told me she also got some growth in the pituitary gland as well. Okay, uh, your vision, any problem with your vision? My vision has been, I mean, after the all, it's, it, it actually backs to almost normal already. La. Right, good. So, uh, may I examine you? Yeah, sure. So, I want to check for the hand, any tremor? There's no tremor. Any palma erythema? Uh, no palma erythema. Okay, for the pulse, is it regular? Pulse is regular. And the rate, the heart rate, I mean the pulse rate? It's regular and good volume. 
Okay. Uh, so check for any proximal myopathy. Mm, there's no proximal myopathy. I would like to get the uh, postural blood pressure for this patient. Yeah. Uh, there's no postural drop. Okay. Then I check for the uh, face is flushing. Any neck mass? Yeah, so this is the patient neck. There's no neck mass, but you can see there is some hyperpigmentation over the over the neck as well. <clears throat> okay, so any other rash in your body? Yeah, he also noticed that there is some rash over the hands, uh, over the forearm, like, but just it generally like like a skin allergy like that. There's no photo. Yeah. Can I know how long is the rash is has been there? You mean the one on my neck? The neck, correct. Yeah, this thing has been there for quite some time. Like, I can't remember, almost almost five five months already. Mm -hmm. So uh, the after your gland removal, any other therapy like uh, the radiation therapy? Or... No, no. No, no chemotherapy and his has been well? Yeah, uh, yeah. well? Yeah, well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Two minutes left. Then you are taking, okay. Sorry, what was yeah. Any other medication that you are taking? Uh, no, no. I don't take anything else. Okay, do you smoke? Uh, no, I'm not a smoker. And what you are working as? Yeah, so I, I'm actually working as a promoter. La. So this thing make me feel very embarrassed. You keep on having fresh, then my client is not comfortable. That's why I'm very stressed also. Alright, okay. Um, sorry, um, uh, Mr. Alex, what is your concern? Uh, I mean, you mentioned about the embarrassing and any other thing else? Yeah, so so doctor, can this be SLE? Uh? Because I read on online, they told me this redness over my face, it can be due to this SLE. I'm worried. Uh? Mm, from the examination and also history, i probably uh, less likely to be SLE, but I'm taking a condition called um, Vipoma. Uh, don't worry, it's basically uh, a condition that causing all these symptoms, uh, your loose stool and your flushing, and also your uh, fast raising of heartbeat. Um, uh, there's some um, protein secreted in the, your body that causing you to have all these symptoms. So we would like to uh, take uh, some blood test and also um, do some imaging to confirm the diagnosis. Then only we can uh, see how we can proceed for your treatment. Is this a family disease? Uh, uh, I don't think so. I don't think it runs in the family. Okay, all right. And, and is this curable? Uh, if it is confirmed, uh, we hope that we can give you uh, some medication to treat for that. Okay, okay, doctor. So, so do you mean that I have a cancer? Uh, uh, this, um, sorry, I cannot uh, answer you for now. Uh, I, I need to uh, discuss back with my uh, superior uh, for that. Then I come back to you. Okay, all right. Okay, time's out. Uh, Dr. Ku, can you tell me the diagnosis and differential analysis for this patient? Uh, my diagnosis here, it could be a, a bipoma in my, in my provisional diagnosis because of the history, the diarrhea, the precipitating factor, um, and also the palpitation, the flushing. Mm. Uh, differential here, uh, uh, I need to... Any relation, uh, any relation mm. with the pituitary previous pituitary lesion and, and this current presentation? Mm, I, uh, I'm not that sure. Mm, but other differential, I would like to think of probably the, uh, the, the overdose of the thyroid. It can be the differential. Okay. Um, the addison. Okay. Um, I mean, not addison, it's like a hypocortisolism. Uh, also, can be the diagnosis here. Mm, but you haven't checked the buckle for any pigmentation at the hand. You didn't mention about pigmentation. But patient have no pigmentation, hy hyperpigmentation. So how do you investigate this patient? So I would like to send uh, the stool for uh, investigation, the stool for culture, FE, uh, full examination, microscopic examination, uh, over and sees. And then uh, I would like to check for thyroid hormone. I would like to check the cortisol level, uh, the renal profile and immune function test, and full blood count. Uh, uh, um, okay. oh, Is there any diagnostic test that you can do? Any blood test specifically? Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. How would you manage this patient? 
so uh, uh, those who confirm the diagnosis, and then uh, uh, okay, okay, sure. ties up, ties up, yeah, ties up, yeah, okay, okay, okay. all right. So next, next, proceed with the next station. So this is the patient, Mr. Raza. Okay, uh, good morning, Mr. Raza. Dr. Ko here, a uh, doctor in the acute emergency department. Uh, can I know uh, what you are coming? I mean, what uh, what that brings you to the hospital? Yeah, doctor, I have been suffering for I uh, don't know some weakness and also uh, numbness over my left hand uh, for the past six months, and this thing has been troubling me because I actually work as mechanic and I'm a left hander as well. You are left hander, and the weakness is uh, only at the left side. Yeah, only at the left side. Only at the left. Okay, so right side has been no problem. So you are having the problem for about six months. Yeah, yeah. Can I know how do you um I mean first notice about the thing? I mean the numbness and the weakness. Yeah. So initially, when I when I because I at the left handed, so I tend to do things a lot. And initially, I notice some numbness when I when I hold things. I can't really feel much. I thought it's just normal. But subsequently, as the days go by, for the past six months, it actually become worse. And I can feel like this numbness sensation is only limited to my up to my hand. I mean, my my forearm, my up my out my elbow region all seems to be bad. It just affect the 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 the, the end of it. The hand only. Yeah, the hand. Any painful joint? No, my joint seems fine. Okay. Any swelling? Um, uh, swelling. No, not 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 really. I don't notice any swelling. Alright. Oh, okay. Uh, is there any trauma before to your hand? Yeah. Fortunately, I think uh three months ago, I actually uh I I actually injured myself at work lah. I think I have industrial injury because of the car, the the screw. Loosen up, so I was I was injured, uh, but that was three months ago. Okay, can I see your hand? Uh, like which part? Can you show me? Uh, the injury is. Yeah. So this is actually the left hand. Uh, just ignore it. I know it's the right hand, but it's left hand. Okay. Oh, all right. So uh, what is I mean the scar the the injury part. Uh, I mean it, the the injury is over my wrist uh, but there's no scar. Uh, it's just just okay. some pain. All right. Okay. So uh. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, any uh, appetite change? Uh, not really. I don't notice any change in appetite. Okay, any weight change? No. Okay, uh, any loose stool? No, no. Any tummy pain? No. Any vomiting? No. I do notice that you have some uh, uh, lesion over your face. Can I know all about, more about that? Yeah, so I have some skin problem. La. I don't know. It, it actually started way longer. La. So it, almost one year already, I noticed this. Other, other than that, you can see my face and, and, and my, my chin. And I want to show you, this is my back as well. Got this, like, don't know what, what kind of skin problem is this. Some whitening of the skin. Mm, yeah, how long it has been there again? Almost one year. One year already. All right. Okay. Is that painful? No, it's not painful. No, no itchiness. Okay. Uh, can I examine your hand? Yeah, so sure. I'll have to check the function, ask him to uh, make a fist. So this is the hand at resting position. Resting position. Can you make a fist for me? Yeah, when as he make a fist, uh, mm. I mean the as he make a fist, he cannot really uh cannot really close his uh little finger and also the, the, the ring finger. Alright, can you uh, open up your all your fingers? Yeah, this is the and open up is like this. All right, okay. So uh, I would like to check the, I mean, uh, Froman test. Uh, I mean, I will click the a paper over the, uh, I mean, the thumb and also the, I mean, how to say uh, the yeah, yeah. So as you as you ask paper to hold using a thumb, and uh, in the horizontal position, the patient cannot perform. Froman is positive. Froman positive. Okay. Uh, then I will check no scar. I mentioned. Uh, and then I will, uh, uh, I mean, I check, I mean, I check the radial nerve out to uh, call out the wrist. Able to call out the wrist? Yeah, mm -hmm. patient able to call out the wrist. There's no wrist drop, there's no finger drop. Alright, okay, so check for the rash over the face. I want mm. to check, uh, it's a hyperpigmentation right, over the face. Yeah, it's hyperpigmentation and there's some nodular kind of lesion as well, as you see in the forehead. Alright, do you have any uh, hearing problem? No, no hearing problem. Okay, do you have a, uh, I want to check for the tongue as well, see any, I mean, macrobrosia. Tongue, tongue is normal. 
Okay, check for the neck, any lymph node? No, no lymph nodes. Okay, then check for the back, uh, I mean the hypopigmented area, yeah. any other rash? So, as you check the hypopigmented area, the patient told you that actually those, those whitish spots, he feel like a bit numb as well. Numbness, okay. Alright, then check for legs, any, um, uh, I mean, uh, edema or rash? No, no rash, no edema. Any joint deformity? No joint problem. Okay, do you have any fever? Uh, no fever. Any cough? No cough. Any family members with a similar problem? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm staying in hostel for the past uh, one year already. La. I never contact with them. Do you have any travel to overseas or anywhere outside from your hometown recently? No, I didn't travel, but I stay in Sungai Bulo. La. Okay. Uh, what do you working as? I work as mechanic, like I said. Mechanic, alright. Uh, do you smoke? No, I don't smoke. Doctor, I also got diabetes, you know, and I don't know whether this is all due to my diabetes. Mm. The numbness is like only one hand, right? The other hand has been totally normal. Yeah, yeah, I feel normal. Mm. Okay, sorry to ask, do you take alcohol? Two minutes left? Uh, no, I don't drink alcohol. Mm. Okay, any other medication uh, you take? I, I'm, I'm only taking metformin 500 mg BD. La. My sugar control, the doctor told me, is good. Mm. How's your vision? Uh, it's fine, normal. My vision has been normal. Alright, Mr. Raza, what is your concern? Yeah, so uh, can it can this problem be is due to my injury at the at the workshop? Uh, uh, I don't think so. It's related to your injury because your injury has been quite long. Uh, I mean, I mean, your injury is before the symptoms come, right? It's actually after the symptom come. After the symptom come, so it's unlikely because the symptom has been uh longer than that. And uh, because of the skin lesion and also uh, your, I mean, your your hand, uh, I mean, unable to function properly. So I would think this is due to some infection, what we call uh, leprosy. And it's basically the infection that affect your nerve and also skin. So it causing uh, your, your hand position to be like this and also some numbness. And also the, the, the skin lesion on your face and also the uh, body. Oh no, do you mean that I have leprosy? Uh, this is uh, my, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the first one of the diagnoses in my mind. So we need to investigate further actually. Oh, doctor, I heard that, uh, I mean, I have friends that have leprosy as well. La. So I heard that when the patient started on treatment for leprosy, the skin will become dark. Is it true? La? The treatment will become dark. Um, hmm. This one, I think I need to... Um, discuss further with my superior and get back to you. Okay. Can, can this be due to my diabetes uh, instead of this you know, leprosy? It can be one of the diagnoses. I mean, uh, possibility that it's due to diabetes, but it's like unlikely because it's only involved one hand. Usually, diabetic will be a two. Okay, time's up. Okay, Dr. Ku, can you tell me the different uh, working diagnosis and differential diagnosis? My working diagnosis here will be leprosy. Um, differential... A full, a full diagnosis. Sorry, a full diagnosis. Full diagnosis. Uh, full diagnosis. Leprosy. Uh, with the complication of uh, uh, with the com the complication of the ulna nerve. Uh, right, left, eh? left, left, hand. left. Yeah, left hand. Uh, uh palsy. Okay, all right. Differential. Uh, yeah. Differential. It could be a diabetic, uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, other differential I could need to rule out is the visual deficiency because the patient on metformin. Mm. Uh, other things like uh, hypothyroid I need to rule out uh, 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 some electrolytes imbalance uh, uh, I, I need to investigate further okay how will you investigate for this patient so I would like to do to confirm the diagnosis of the process I do a skin biopsy and uh, the about the ulna nerve palsy I would like to do a nerve conduction study and uh, check the renal profile, electrolytes, uh, thyroid function test, B12 and folate, uh, and then HbA1c to check the, I mean the, the control of the diabetic mellitus. Uh, okay. How will you manage the patient? So uh, for leprosy, I will start antibiotic, uh, um, and then if any any electrolyte imbalance, I will correct them. 
uh, I will control the diabetic as well, uh, according to the um, diabetic control. And then also... Um, what kind of antibiotic and what uh, for how long do you know? Yeah, I, I cannot remember for now. Okay, all right. And let's say the patient actually, uh, okay, time's up actually, but this is just a question, extra question. So let's say uh, the patient actually stay with his his uh, housemate, la, also have the same thing. What do you want to offer for the housemate? Um, hmm. The housemate have no symptom, la, but, but the housemate has been staying with him for almost three months now. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. So it's tricky. Right? I mean, this is, I mean, I, I think your, your scenario is more difficult than the first candidate. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry because it's the way I, I arrange it. <laughs> yeah. So, so how, how do you feel for the first scenario first before we discuss further? Yes, actually, yeah, I, I, I'm not really know about the diagnosis. But, but, but why you choose, why you choose VIP MoMA, which is so rare? Uh, uh, it's because of the uh, the flushing and then also I think the uh, I think the precipitating mm. factor mm. what are the precipitating factor that that actually t- uh, triggers uh, this the cheese chocolate uh, that, the, mm. but actually I, I forgot the <laughs> I mean the mechanism behind it the part of the show. So, so those are the those are the tyramine rich food lah, huh? uh, yeah. beer, cheese, chocolate. So so but but why VIP Homa other than more common diagnosis? VIP Homa is really rare. Lah. I can see that you your system area is very good and your timing is quite good because you managed to uh, reach almost four minutes, then you start to examine patient. And you I mean your timing not a problem, lah. but now your problem is actually this is again this is not an easy case, lah. so probably it's because of the question problem. Uh, it's a bit difficult lah. So, but but uh, let's say lah. Let let's say just forget this scenario. Let's say the patient have flushing, episodic flushing, abdominal pain, as well as palpitation and breathlessness. What is your differential diagnosis? Uh, few chromos and Uh, but the, the patient don't have blood pressure is normal. Don't have any hypertension and no excessive sweating, right? Just just flushing, just flushing. Uh, diarrhea, but diarrhea actually you didn't ask me in detail. Actually, diarrhea you should ask whether it is relieved by fasting or not. If you ask me this page, this then I will tell you actually with fasting also that di- diarrhea persists. So it's a secretory diarrhea, not not osmotic diarrhea. La. So flushing, secretory diarrhea, uh, <laughs> episodic abdominal pain as well as palpitation. What are the your differential diagnosis? Flushing. Or probably another way to ask is what is the difference analysis of a mala rash? Mala rash. I mean, just just name a few, then we can go through together. Uh oh, uh the dermatomyositis. Uh, uh dermatomyositis usually will not have a uh, mala rash. Uh, you will have the. Yeah, usually it's a usually heritage rash over the eye periorbital region. Okay, but generally, if you look at the patient face when you go into this scenario with the diarrhea, I mean, if me, I would think about three things. Uh, first is actually, I'm also equally clueless. Actually, if, I, if, I, if I'm you, I will also be shocked, to be honest, because it's diarrhea and not rash like that. So first thing is, can it be SLE? Because anyway, Bangladesh commonness is still SLE, right? Second possibility is, can this be some form of mitral stenosis? Because patient also like, uh, young, but it's a young man like, again probably there is some rheumatic heart disease we don't know but can this be mitral stenosis but why mitral stenosis if you have diarrhea unless the patient have infected endocarditis and what kind of infected endocarditis the patient may have is the strep bovis infected endocarditis that uh, can associate with mitral stenosis like, but it's quite rare to occur right so again flushing per se the, then the next is endocrinal causes which can explain all the symptoms this is carcinoid syndrome this is carcinoid syndrome. So this patient actually came out as a mock in Sungai Bolo a like, few years ago. I think before the Sungai Bolo closed down as the center, I think they came up with this scenario. Like. And that, that, that particular lady, I think, uh, I, I heard from my friend, senior, that particular lady actually have this. You know what is this? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like hyperpigmentation, don't know what is that, right? So this is very classic. The moment if, if, if you never encounter this case before, definitely you won't know. 
So it's it's not your it's not your fault. <laughs> please please don't blame yourself. But this is actually what we call as castle necklace sign. Castle necklace sign. It's a hyperpigmentation over the region, like the the, the castle necklace region, which actually suggests niacin deficiency. So niacin deficiency, which is pelagia, basically the patient has pelagia. So this is actually pelagia, and pelagia is commonly associated with carcinoid syndrome. So that's why this is not an easy scenario. Like, it's very difficult. It was very tough. Like. That patient, I think the Sungai Buloh one is also something similar history. Uh, secretary diarrhea, episodic uh, abdominal pain, and also flushing, and and also a bit of flushing over the face. Like. Then when they examine the neck, also a bit of darkish like that, hyperpigmented like that. So actually the patient has a very, very difficult case. Like. This one is not an easy case. So, but it's good for discussion. Like, huh? So don't feel bad. So basically the patient has chronic secretary diarrhea, Facial flushing, palpitation, if you ask, SOB, and then associated with metamine, which food I will come back to you why. And also a skin darkening over the neck. Lah. And if you ask about the past medical in which you did ask, there is some pituitary macroadenoma which is non-functioning and done the op. So what is the relationship with carcinoid syndrome and 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 this my pituitary microadenoma? Do you know? Don't know so. <laughs> Yeah, so possibly it's uh, one of the pancreatic lesions. Like, so it can be MEN1 syndrome. So under your differential diagnosis, you should put as MEN1 syndrome as well. Like. Uh, I know this is not an easy scenario, like, but this is just a way to mm -hmm. kind of like let us refresh together. Like. So it's not an easy scenario, but when when you know about the basic, eventually you will feel like this is not, not that difficult. But in this scenario, uh, the clue actually is you need to rule out MEN1. That's why uh, other than getting all the positive issues, you should actually exclude parathyroid hyperplasia, which is a hypercalcemia symptom. You should ask about polyuria, polyglycia, any renal stone before to exclude that. Because if you ask that, and even if you don't have that, like, with two out of three is also fulfilled as the MEN1 syndrome as well. And at the same time, but, but I noticed you did ask about hypoglycemia symptom. I think you screened for insulinoma like, based on your history. You ask about any tremor, any sweating, excessive sweating. It seems like you are going towards that direction. Initially, I thought you got the diagnosis of carcinoma already. Then suddenly you, you surprised me with VIPoma. I also don't know how the VIP one present. Like, it's very rare. It's very rare. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. and glucagonoma is just a rash. Right? Basically nothing uh, nothing significant. So clinical sign, yes, you must mention this mara rash. And because I mean there's this is something bonus. Like, even if you didn't document uh even if you didn't mention it's okay. And dermatitis, because I didn't show the photo also, so not very fair. But this kind of carcinoid patient, you should examine the CVS like, because they usually will have a tricuspid regurge. Uh, tips right, which is a tricuspid insufficiency and pulmonary stenosis. So, if you examine the patient, patient actually have a tricuspid uh, regurgitation, uh, and patient may have a wrong chi because of the bronchospasm and because of this episodic issue, uh, And abdomen also to look for any hepatomegaly as well. So the diagnosis is actually a carcinoid syndrome with pelagia because of the nascent deficiency and the castle necklace sign, uh. Differential can be. Uh, MEM1 can be SLE, can be RBD. La. So investigation, actually to diagnose carcinoid syndrome is 24-hour urinary 5-HIAA, hydroxyindoacetic acid. And you can also do a fasting chromogranin A. Generally for all, uh, I mean it looks com complex, right? but generally for all pancreatic lesion, like, you will usually do fasting chromogranin and if you suspect carcinoma, you should do five, uh, urinary 5-HIAA. So fasting chromogranin can actually exclude whether there's any pituitary lesion or not. Let's say, uh, not, not pituitary, sorry, pancreatic lesion. So let's say the gastrinoma, insulinoma, gluconoma, all those things, the chromogranin may be elevated as well. Okay, and the calcium profile, you, mu you must check because you're suspecting parathyroid hyperplasia. Pituitary profile as well, although patient is now on hormone replacement, you sh it's also good to check, make sure that the, the pituitary function is still good. And echo is basically because carcinoid syndrome tends to have heart failure as well, and also we have a tricuspid vigorous and pulmonary stenosis. And the last is the functional uh, scan, uh, which is a dotatic scan, or it's a, what we call as a scintigraphy, uh, to, to actually look for pancreatic uh, lesion, hypometabolic pancreatic lesion, uh, the special dotatic scan. Okay, So education and counseling for management, uh, manage, MD, uh, I mean, the management is difficult, uh, to be honest. If you can mention carcinoid, you can know how to diagnose. And you can mention the refer to endocrine, I think you can pass very well already. It's not easy. But actually, I mean, in HKL, based on the history, uh, we do have a few uh, carcinoid syndrome in the past, uh, but, but not, not during my time, what I heard from the senior. Uh. So carcinoid patient, very dangerous. They can present as carcinoid crisis one. 
So the main important thing you need to mention about carcinoid syndrome is perhaps the osteotype. You must mention the, the osteotype, which is the somatostatic analog. And that is a role between a uh, pharmaco or surgical intervention. Basically, the medication just to die through before a definitive surgical operation to remove the tumor. Okay, and there's other new therapy which I don't think is important, like Ivaramius, Temolozumab, which is all rare. But you can mention that because patient also got pelagia, you should also replace the B complex or, or just vitamin B3 or nicotamine infusion for the pelagia. And another thing is to avoid the triggers, right? Just like celiac disease, you should avoid those uh, gluten rich diet. That's why you should avoid the tyramine food. You should also avoid stress. And another thing is the SSRI, which patient is not on. Let's say patient is on, yes. So generally, is this a family disease? Yes, if you're thinking that this MEM1, this can be a family disease. Is this curable? It can be potentially curable with surgery. However, you require MDT on that. Is this SLV? No. Okay, so this is the first case. You have any question? No. Yeah, very difficult, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but I think I think good, really good attempt. I can I can see that your your differential analysis is almost there already. Just that you cannot name out this carcinoid syndrome. So uh, I just want to go through this uh, just a brief one. So carcinoid syndrome is just is a form of neuroendocrine tumor. So actually it converts uh uh basically our tryptophan is converted to five hydroxy tryptophan and eventually become five HIA in urine. So in carcinoid syndrome with a high level of this. 5-HT will eventually become 5-HIA in urine. That's why we measuring that. Lah. Okay? And the symptom is like what you mentioned, bronchospasm, flushing, dyspnea, palpitation. And the complication is most likely is a heart problem as well as the as well as the retroperitoneal organ that can get uh, I can get intestinal obstruction because of mesentery fibrosis, can get pelagia because of vitamin B3, B3 deficiency. Sometimes can even lead to psychiatric disorder and generally is the carcinoid heart. And the last one in which not uh, not expecting people to get is a carcinoid crisis. Uh. In HKL, there's one patient admitted to the carcinoid crisis very, very bad. We really want to collapse already. Uh. So it can be very severe. So what is a carcinoid crisis? It actually is the symptoms of hypotension, tachycardia, basically in shock. Uh. And the shock is mainly due to cardiac arrhythmia as well, can went into full-blown cardiogenic shock. So and at the same time, the lung also can went into bronchospasm, very severe one. So all those things can actually all those things actually due to the tryptophan. You know? So that's why actually it, 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 it triggers this symptomatic storm. Okay? And the triggers actually stress surgery, radiotherapy. This PRRT is one of the radio, radionucleotide therapy to treat this carcinoma syndrome. You know? But this thing, usually with, uh, that, that's the reason why actually, in fact, before the operation itself, you should, uh, we should usually start the patient on IVR osteotype infusion. So to pre prevent the carcinoid crisis, to control the level of this 5-HT, and subsequently to make sure that patient isn't went into crisis. Uh. That's why patient can go for op and can go for the this radio therapy with the pre-operative IVI osteotype. Uh. So the measure is just like that, basically. Okay. So the second case, yeah, second case, I think you got the diagnosis. You got it's a leprosy, which is very good, and you got this left ulnar palsy. Uh. You managed to mention formal sign, which is really good enough. And whether or not you want to do what the bird sign, the finger escape sign. Is, is optional, but generally, if you manage to appreciate that there's an ulnar crawl hand, that is a formal sign, and to justify there's a left ulnar palsy, then it's good enough. So the patient actually, this is actually again another common scenario, and I, I don't know why I purposely mentioned about Sumebolo, because Sumebolo used to be a Kusta, <laughs> yeah, you know, right, the leprosy center for the hospital. So anyway, uh, leprosy is very uncommon, I mean, it's very rare nowadays, but Sometimes we do occasionally see one or two cases in like some re referral for some history. Sometimes it do happen. Uh. And and the history, the clue that you managed to get is actually quite good. You mentioned about the numbness and also you managed to explore the, the hypopigmented patches and you also but you didn't you didn't ask me anything about past medical history, even until the concern I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. That's why I decided to just give you a hint because I think it's important for you to ask the past medical history as well as drug history earlier. Because you are suspecting, for example, even if this is an isolated ulnar nerve palsy, you really need to make sure that you're not dealing with any form of peripheral neuropathy and, and the common cause still medica uh, medication and as well as the past medical history. That's why it's still important to ask. And mechanic, yes, purposely give you that it's actually uh, the this injury actually started. Uh, right after he already has symptoms, so may not be the cause. And whenever a situation that you, you encounter any scenario with hand numbness and weakness, you should always go out any hypocalcemia symptom. This is one of the clues we really need to make sure we, we, look, uh, we rule out it. 
So another thing is, uh, another differential you should probably rule out if this is a bipolar is actually Takayasu arthritis, can, which also can present as numbness and weakness. So you may want to offer, just, just screen through by mentioning, want to measure the four lines BP and the differential BP rather there's any discrepancy and the feel for the pulse. This is just a screening. But this patient only unilateral, so perhaps not very important. And the face, uh, actually the face uh, actually is a caudiflower like ear uh, and there's also a collapsed nose. So actually very classic for severe leprosy. Uh, those lepromatous leprosy, although they don't have a leonine kind of faces, very I mean those only found in India, uh, Malaysia one, Malaysia version is caudiflower. Uh, so you see the ear here is more like a caudiflower kind, a lot of distorted ear loops. Uh, and at the same time you see the nose, nose actually deformer. Uh, it's, it's like a moon being shot by the metro like that so it's like it's like a very deformed nose and the face also deformed and you should and you didn't manage to actually check the sensation over this hypopigmented skin but this is what the patient told you you should offer to check and another thing you perhaps can be i mean can can do better is actually you should offer to feel for any thickened nerve so commonly it's the great auricular nerve near your uh, near near the patient ear Another one is the common peroneal nerve, which is near the uh, near the uh, posterior compartment of the leg. Lah. So common peroneal nerve and great, uh, great auricular nerve is one of the things that can be taken, especially in leprosy. Lah. Okay, so an investigation you mentioned correctly, skin biopsy, NCS, that's the most important thing. And perhaps to score further, you should also mention about G6PD screening. Lah, because you want to start the patient on Depson. Lah. I think you cannot remember the medication. It's very difficult. I only learned about the, the regime when I prepared for my exam also. I never really encountered that in real life. But I saw one, one patient with a proxy in, in back in HKL that time, emergency. So so but but just remember is the how to remember it? There's no way. I mean different people use different mnemonic. You can use CDR. La. CDR is like what we usually use the chemo form, right? The CDR. To, to send to the pharmacy. So C is actually the cofazamine, D is like Depson, and R is the Vifampicin. Bear in mind that the proxy is like a sibling to TB. So the big backbone of the TB is the Vifampicin, still there. And another two drugs, which is not commonly used, that is the thing that need to monitor. So cofazamine, the reason why I ask you, what will my skin become dark after the treatment? It's very common question if you encounter any leprosy patient uh, started on this medication. Eventually, their body, their skin will become hyperpigmented. All, all this is because of the cofazamine. So cofazamine can actually cause skin darkening. Like. So, but, and, and some they can be very concerning when they are start on this medication because we know that the duration for leprosy, depending on the, on the severity, like. if it's a palsy bacillary, then it's usually six months, one to two years for multi bacillary. So meaning to say, palsy bacillary is more to like tuberculous leprosy and multi bacillary is more like lepromatous leprosy. Like. So it depends on the title. So one to two, so generally quite long, like six months to two years time. So uh, their skin can become dark, but you have to assure them that if you, after completed the treatment, after this cofazamine is stopped, the skin can, can be reversed, is reversible. Huh? So, so that's the, probably the extra thing. Uh, but I don't think we'll come out in exam. Uh, I don't think some of the examiners may not even know about this. But this is just something nice to know. And it's also important when we start patient on... Next time, who knows that we'll encounter any patient with a proxy and we start the patient on this triple regime and we need to counsel them. Just like hydroxychloroquine or just like any other drugs, we need to counsel them on the side effects. Okay, Hydroxychloroquine, last session we discussed about 7% of to develop uh, uh, gray, grayish blue pigmentation of the skin. Same goes to cofazamine. Cofazamine also can actually cause a uh, skin hyperpigmentation. And another thing about this leprosy is because it's a siblings of TB, so this patient is also infectious, you know. That's why the Fungai Bulu set out the, the Kusta center just to contain all the leprosy patients, uh, which makes sense, right? So all the patient in close, I mean all the contact that is actually close to the patient should be given chemoprophylaxis, chemoprophylaxis which is just single step dose of rifampicin. Uh. So this is another exam question. Uh. But this is a bit detailed, but something that we really need to know for leprosy. Like, we really need to give a chemoprophylaxis for those close contact. Okay, so there is just some information on leprosy. Like, so less severe one, which is a tuberculoid, okay, or palsy bacillary. And then severe one is more to lepromatous like, and borderline is somewhere in between. And don't need to know about all those things, but just make sure that uh, know about skin biopsy, hypomimidation can have a lot of this uh, hypoesthetic patch. Sometimes can be burning as well, dry scaly lesion. And this is another diagram I think is important because actually it's 
that proxy is actually transmitted to the air and transmitted to the close contact. And that's why it's important to highlight on the fact of infection control, contact tracing, as well as to giving the prophylaxis. Okay, so I think, uh, and you can see that the symptom here, nerve damage to the hand, arm, legs, muscle. You did ask about the eye, but actually she has no eye symptom. Okay, mm -hmm. so probably that's all for this session. So I, I, I'm preparing for my notes, la. so don't know when it will be coming, but now it's still ongoing. So if anyone interested later on, once it's ready, I can post in the group. La. So my, my notes mainly contain those, this, all this table, you know, and all those approach that I generally learn from various mentor tutors, like including Dr. Hassan as well. So I think it will be helpful if, if I can share with everyone later on. But I think for now, it's not ready. So yeah, that's all. So anyone got any question? Before we end the session, do we do we do we do like the contact tracing? Do we do like like sputum or what? Uh, something else? Except we should always start prophylaxis, or we need to do something like TB. We need to check for actually. Uh, yeah. So so this question is same as medical cockle uh close contact uh. So in medical cockle close contact, we don't. We don't screen, I mean, we, we don't screen with any tests. We just treat with antibiotic and then because they are deemed as close contact. So we don't routinely check for that. But after given prophylaxis, if they develop any symptom, become symptomatic, then they should go to come to hospital and, and be being investigated, which include this uh, skin biopsy, for example, the, the split skin smear. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? The, the clofazimine side effect for the hyperpigmentation, is it particularly called the h tyrosis or like just generalized? Actually, I'm not sure. Actually, I'm also not very sure. La. <laughs> but probably you can read all on that and probably anyone of us can, can share in the group as well so that we all can learn. I only know it can cause skin darkening, la, but the exact the exact uh, uh, name to it, whether it's tyrosis or not, I am not entirely sure. Because for incident, I, I read about h tyrosis. Then I saw the medication list inside got this profazimine. Uh, possible, possible. I think uh one of the because this you know in Malaysia our leprosy patients are not followed under neuro, but actually it's followed under derm. So them are seeing and monitoring all this side effect as well. La. So you will be wondering why why I mean TB is followed under chest, but why leprosy is followed under under skin, under derm? Because most likely the presentation is is a cutaneous manifestation. Uh. That's why it actually triggers them to, to work out for the first. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I hope everyone uh, learned something. Uh. I mean, today, tonight is a quite a tough night. Uh. So, yeah, I mean, the cases may not be very straightforward. But generally, all these cases came out in mock or even in real exam before. Uh. That's why it's important to go through. These are kind of like a bit of like museum cases, like classic museum cases. But, uh, if I have time later on, probably as the exam comes nearer for those who are taking the exam, probably we should go through more common cases uh, like thyroid cases, all those very commonly like acromegaly I go through last time, so I won't go through. But probably uh, some other cases, uh, I, I have a few in my mind, but but it's a bit uh, tired and everyone is already late. So, okay, I think that's all we are in our session. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>